Hi, this is Greg from Structure Toolkit, and in this video, we're going to go through how to design a timber column. Depending on what kind of design you want to perform, you can design a timber column using either the timber member design, column, circular column, or mullion modules. The difference between each is similar to that of the steel column, which we have previously done a video on. The member design is a kind of all encompassing design module where you'd be able to design a timber column for various vertical and lateral loading scenarios and end restraints but it will typically take longer to use. The timber column module is the go-to module for a compression or tension column not subject to out of plane loadings. The circular column is then similar, but for circular cross sections. Finally, the mullion module can be used to design a pinned end member for outwards and inwards wind action with axial load, and would be a commonly used module to design an external stud in a residential house, for example. The timber column, circular column and mullion modules all have a similar layout and so once you understand one of these modules, it should be fairly straightforward to use the others. In this video, we'll be designing a double stud that supports a floor beam in a house. Our column height will be 3 meters with noggins at a maximum of 1200 millimeter spacings. The floor beam we'll use will be the one from the beam design video. Our design loads will consist of axial compression from the floor beam along with a moment force due to an eccentricity. This kind of design is best suited with the timber column module, so we'll use that. So before opening up our column design, we'll need to first import our beam design into this project. To do that, we'll go document and click import. We'll find our beam design project and then find our floor beam one. We'll also need to import RB1 as RB1 had a reaction on floor beam one. And we'll go open. Here we can see RB1 and 4 beam one imported. Often you'll need to recalculate reactions to ensure existing linked reactions are correctly applied. So we'll go project and recalc all. We'll then open up our 4 beam one to make sure we have the RB1 reaction applied correctly, which it is. We can see our 4 beam one reaction here is 4 kilonewtons dead load and 4.7 kilonewtons live load. These will be the values we'll use in our timber column design. So we'll go back to the desktop and open up a timber column module. We'll call our column column DSO1 to represent a double stud. First section of our design is the geometry. Our category will be the same as the category of our supporter member, which if we have a look is two. We'll tick yes for house. This will alter the long and short term psi values used as per 1170.0 and 1720.1, which for floor loads affects both the live load deflection and more importantly, the dead load only ultimate reactions. For the column module, this affects the dead load only ultimate compression and tension, along with the corresponding automatically calculated eccentric dead load only moment. We'll discuss this moment a bit later. So our length is three meters as discussed. Our strong axis effective length refers to the distance between points of effectively rigid restraint against buckling against that axis, as outlined in AS 1720.1. Our stud column will be sitting within a stud framed wall with the larger dimension perpendicular to the wall, that is the main axis being along the length of the wall. So our LAX here will just be the length of our column as there typically isn't going to be any restraint on the internal and external edges of the wall to resist buckling. Our weak axis effective length is then going to be based on our noggins, as they will restrain against buckling about that axis. Our LAYB is then our lateral restraint for major axis bending, which in most cases is going to be the same as our minor axis effective length. As we can see, it defaults to this value at the moment, so we can leave it as it is. You'll also need to have an awareness of how the edge restraint affects the capacity in conjunction with the effective bending length LAYB. This edge restraint is used in the calculation of the slenderness S1, which is then used for the stability factor K12 for the bending capacity. For members that have a low depth to breadth ratio and short effective bending lengths, K12 will typically calculate out to one. This will often be the case for most column designs. Interestingly, unlike steel, the compression edge is not always the critical edge, where you will often find with beam designs that having the compression edge restraint results in a lower capacity. As our column is going to be part of stud framing, we can leave our effective length factor G13 as 0.9. Next, we have our compression loads. 
As we're just designing our column for our beam reaction, we can bring this in as a linked reaction. To do that, we'll first delete the loads, highlight all our cells, right click, add reaction. Here we get our floor beam one. For this example, we'll pick the left reaction. Another way you might do a design like this on a project with a number of beams is to work out the maximum axial loads for a certain column size and material grade, and then use that column for all the beam supports that do not exceed that load. We also spoke about this in our steel column video. We'll pick our live load duration to be floor, which will affect our duration K1 and side factors. As our floor beam doesn't have any uplift, we can ignore the tension section. Finally, we have the bending section of our design, which already has some default inputs in it. Although we would typically design a beam supported on a stutter's pin, it is important to consider any possible eccentricity of the beam reaction on the column. In reality, the reaction is unlikely to be distributed centrally down the column, with the load possibly more weighted towards the side of the beam span direction. Also, structures in the real world will often never have their frame in perfectly aligned, so there will always be inherent eccentricities. AS1720 doesn't actually provide any guidance on any minimum eccentricities that should be considered when designing a timber column, only alluding to it in Appendix B when discussing suggested loads for serviceability in timber design. However, if you've watched the steel column design video, you know that AS4100 does provide minimum eccentricity requirements for column design. Where a steel column supporting a beam, should take the beam's reaction at either the center of bearing, 100 millimeters from the face of the column, or at the face of the column, depending on the connection type. For a timber column design, a suitable approach might then be to take the eccentricity on the timber column to the face of it, giving us an eccentricity of depth on two. If we look back to our moment input cells, we can see this is exactly what we have. Our N star multiplied by the depth divided by 2000 with it being 2000 instead of 2 to convert it into the correct units. This is just one approach, however. It will be up to the user to use their engineering judgment to decide what is appropriate for each individual design case. If we look at AS1720.3, studs supporting concentrated loads can be designed with a moment of zero. However, this design doesn't include any wind action, which will often need to be considered, especially when dealing with external walls. So you'll often still end up designing with a moment anyways. To design a stud with a wind load on it, you would use the Mullion design module, which we'll have a look at shortly. First, we'll finish off our column design. So this design will adopt the default input approach, as this way we can be confident we've accounted for any possible eccentricities. The rest of this module then goes through the various design methods for axial bending and combined action. At the top, we can see a summary of our design forces and capacities. In our case, we can see our column is within capacity and as a double 90 by 45 NGP 10 column is a common stud size within a house, we'll keep it as this. And with that, we've finished our timber column design. We'll have a quick look at the mullion design now to see how it differs from this module. In here, much of the inputs are the same, except instead of a moment input section, we get an eccentricity input. This relates to the moment created from the applied point load in the major axis, and so is similar to that of the default input of the column module. Below we then have a wind input section, which will apply a lateral inwards and outwards wind UDL along the mullion. This will create a moment based on WL squared on 8 at mid-span of the mullion. There is also a point load input section where you might have a wall tie or similar fixed into the side of the mullion. It's also worth mentioning that for simplicity, the moment resulting from the vertical point load eccentricity is added directly to the maximum inward or outwards moment due to a wind action, depending on the sign of the eccentricity. The moment as a result of the point load is also added directly to these as well. In reality, the eccentric moment at the top of the column will result in a triangular moment distribution, which is zero at the bottom. And the point load maximum may be away from the mid-span maximum from the UDL, depending on the point of application. You can see then that in absence of a more complete analytical approach, this will be conservative. If you want to optimize this result, you could perhaps use the analysis light and member design to do this. Finally, the Mullion design module also includes outwards and inwards deflection due to wind. That about covers all you need to know for completing a timber column design in Toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. 
If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.